All right, just wanted to give you a little bit of pump up here and uh, get everybody started because right now is the time for security. And uh, we just want to get started with that. And uh, I want to welcome everybody and uh, tell you I appreciate everyone being here this year. Uh, as you all know, October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And uh, I'd like to welcome you, more importantly, to the 11th Annual Cybersecurity uh, Awareness Fair. Um, uh, this year, we have over 500 public sector uh, attendees, and we have over 100 private sector. So uh, we've surpassed last year by a great margin. Appreciate that. And uh, today, I think you're going to have a great uh, uh menu of things for you to see in cybersecurity as far as awareness and training goes, and I hope you enjoy yourselves. <clears throat> uh, so there are many things that we can do in cybersecurity, and I'm going to ask a lot of you and all of you to do the cybersecurity pledge for us, please. Um, there is a national uh, push for cyber uh, pledge, and the states that are doing the pledge we are all in competition. Last year, we, uh, we lost out to New Jersey folks, so I'd really like us to be able to beat uh, New Jersey this year. So please, take the cybersecurity pledge, and if you, don't, uh, if you haven't already agreed to allow us to use your name to do the cybersecurity pledge, I'd ask you to get with my staff, and they can help you register and take that pledge. Um, we'd also ask you to uh, encourage all of your uh, coworkers, family, and friends to also take the cybersecurity pledge and make California and put us up number one. Um, also, like you to go to uh, there's a staysafeonline.org, and they can tell you about getting involved, and they've got a section on that. And there's many ways that you can do as a business person, or an educator, or a family member, or a government entity. Uh, to participate and make an impact on cybersecurity, um, not only during Cybersecurity Awareness Month, but also throughout the year and making sure that you and your family stay safe uh, at home 365 days a year. So before we get started and before I introduce um, our first speaker, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's gone on the last year. Um, we have uh, put together the cybersecurity, or excuse me, the IT security uh, committee on policy and program improvement. And what we've done so far is put out a couple of things. Uh, the first thing we do is we uh, put out some quick wins. One of them was to eliminate some of the uh, compliance forms that we have or that you have uh, to submit. And we're trying to streamline our processes so that compliance is easier and it's, uh, it makes it quicker and better for you to underst excuse me, understand what's going on. Um, the second thing we've done, and there's a presentation on that today, um, by um, Patrick and uh, Marianne is on the risk assessment tool and with that we automated uh, the risk score calculations. Um, we've also been working with CalEMA on uh, disaster recovery management program. Um, we have begun uh, working with emergency function 18 which is cyber specific. Um, we're going to be asking uh, agency secretaries to send uh, representatives to, uh, on this committee to put together EF18. So we'd like you to have a saying that. So please participate in that so that we can uh, make the cybersecurity emergency function uh, workable and something that everyone can participate in. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing is that uh, CalEMA has already purchased and is uh, in the process of putting together the incident management uh, or the RIMS replacement that's going to be coming out and we hope to see that come out this year. Uh, excuse me, in, um, late next year, around October of next year. Um, we have been, along with uh, CHP, been actively involved with putting it together and uh, the, the, uh, during design phase all the way to implementation. So they're going to create a sandbox that, uh, for pilot department users um, to test and drive the further design elements which are within the scope. So please, uh, we ask you to participate in that as well. Um, as far as education and awareness goes, we continue to have our ISO basic training. And this year, I'm happy to say that we've uh, trained over 80 folks in our ISO basic training. Um, we are very uh, thankful for folks for participating in that, and uh, we're going to continue down that path. Um, we have information security roundtables. We plan to have several more of those this year, and we're going to be continuing down the path of how can we help agencies and departments with their security and their risk assessments and all of the different elements within there. 
And then, uh, obviously, we're having the uh, IT um, Security Awareness Fair. And this, today, is our chance to really help and show what's going on in the cybersecurity awareness area and also to say what's going on out in the world. I think uh, one of the biggest components and the thing that is going to help us all is for everyone to understand what's going on on the landscape as far as security goes. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen already, but the White House reported that there was a, one of their military networks was um, attacked by a spear phishing attack. Um, and it just shows that uh, the attacks are coming in from the national level all the way down. So it's just a matter of being cautious and uh, making sure that we can have the best defense and always paying attention to what's going on out there in the world. <clears throat> As far as policy goes, um, we're going to continue to update the SAM and make sure that our SAM uh, it, uh, matches with the NIST standards, and we're going to ensure that we use the NASIO taxonomy that we've adopted, and we're continuing down that path, and I want to thank the uh, folks who are on the committee for their uh, diligence in helping us get to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in my closing, I'd like to uh, acknowledge a few folks. Uh, first of all, the vendors that are sponsoring this event, thank you very much for your patience, support on putting this program together. And then uh, we had the advisory board on the private sector side. Thank you very much for that. And then the, uh, the public sector folks uh, that helped drive what the, all of the content was going to be in each one of the content areas. When we put these things together, we don't just throw it together. We want to find out and, and ask folks, what do you want to see? What do you think are the best things to do? And that advisory group are the group that uh, put this together and helped to, uh, decide what we're going to have out here today. I want to also thank uh, public sector partners, Russ and his staff, uh, and Sherilyn. They've been great, had a, uh, a great time putting this together, and uh, it's all culminating today, and appreciate all that support. And then lastly, my staff, who's put in lots of time, effort, and uh, I really appreciate all of that. So I'd like all of you to you know, take the time to look over the events and, and the uh, tracks, see which ones make most sense for you, enjoy yourselves. I know this is gonna be very educational for you, and if you have comments and questions, we're gonna ask for those at the end, so please make sure that you give those to us because we're trying to make this event better every year, and without your comments and uh, questions, we, we can't do that. So thank you very much again for being here for our event. We've got a really full schedule, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce our first speaker, who is uh, our, uh, my boss. Um, Carlos Ramos was appointed by Governor Jerry Brown as the Secretary of the California Technology Agency in July of 2011. As a cabinet member, he advises the governor on the strategic management and direction of the state's information technology resources. Throughout his career, Carlos has been a leader on many of California's key technology initiatives. Prior to his appointment, he has served as a director of the Office of System Integration, Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services, and director of the then Teal Data Center, one of the largest public sector data centers in the world. Carlos helped architect the consolidation of the state's largest data centers and the creation of California's uh, Department of Technology Services. Um, and I want to personally thank my boss for being here because as you all probably know Carlos has got a very busy schedule for so boss I truly appreciate you being here and taking time of your busy schedule to address us so ladies and gentlemen Carlos Ramos good morning it's nice to be here with all of you um, I have to tell you why I'm actually here um, you know Keith has done a great job as uh, Chief Information Security Officer for the state. But most of you know he's got a military background and a lot of connections back to the federal government. I didn't realize how strong his connections were until he got the White House to announce yesterday, right the day before this, about their event. So I don't know how you arrange that, Keith, but good job. <laughs> so um, it's good to see all of you here. I, I think there's more people here this year than there was last year. So I'm glad to see that. Obviously, it's an, it's an issue that continues to concern us and one that really uh, requires a lot of attention for those of us that work in the public sector or that work around the public sector. So just out of curiosity, um, I'd like to know how many of you, maybe you could uh, show, show your hands here, how many of you actually work in the IT security space? 
So a good number of you, actually I'd say more than half, but it also means that the rest of you that are here are also interested, not necessarily working directly in the space, but you recognize the importance of the issue. So it's, I, I want to thank you for being here. I think it's important that you are here. In a minute, I'm going to talk a little bit about why it is important that you are here. Uh, but really what I wanted to talk to you about is what, is, what government is up to generally and uh, some of the challenges that that presents to us. I want to tell you, Keith and uh, Russ and the folks from uh, Public Sector Partners, the Planning Committee, I really like the theme. I like the fact that you guys took off on the uh, Mission Impossible theme. One, because I always thought it had a really cool song to that show. <laughs> and I actually liked at least a couple of the movies. I didn't, I don't know. There was one of them in there that I thought, this is too much. But the other ones had some really cool stuff in it. Uh, so let me tell you what I want to talk to you about. You know, actually none, none of this is going to be earth shattering, but uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about our state of California. Uh, as all of you that live here or that work here or that visit us know, it's a very large state. It's got a very large population. Uh, in terms of government, you know, we have a large government because we have a large set of responsibilities as government. When you look at our government's budget, our state budget, last year was about $142 billion uh, worth of, worth of uh, expenditures in, in our budget. There's over 200 different state agencies with a large diversity of program areas that serve a very large and diverse population. So let's talk a little bit about the population. As you can see, we have uh, a lot of our services online. So let's talk a little bit about the diverse population of California. First of all, as I said, it is a pretty diverse population, and they also have a diverse set of needs from government. One of the things that's kind of interesting is California government for years has been dealing with a bu chronic budget deficit. There's always a gap between revenues that we bring in and what it actually takes to deliver services. There's some efforts that have been uh, made to try and close that gap, and you know, go under Governor Brown's leadership, we've done a, a large part of that. Uh, there's still more work to go, but until the economy really turns around, I think that's an issue that we're going to be dealing with for a long time. The challenge for California in the public sector is that demand for services seems to be inelastic. What that means is, you know, the economy goes bad, the revenues go down. It doesn't necessarily translate into a reduced need for government services. You know, it doesn't mean that there's less drivers that need to be licensed, for example, less uh, roads that need to be completed. Uh, in fact, in some cases, the, it's sort of the inverse. When the economy goes bad, there's an increased demand for services. So for us, it's an important uh, challenge. As we're looking at the California population, another thing that's kind of important to notice is that Californians, for the most part, are very technically savvy. In their personal lives, they use technology for everything from conducting business to the way they get entertainment to the way they communicate. Uh, if you look at the statistics of what happens in California, you'll see that a large part of our, of our traffic on our websites is, comes from mobile devices. Look at our, uh, the second statistic there on 911 calls. We track these on an annual basis. The last couple of years, the vast majority, nearly 80% of our calls come in from mobile phones. Just as an experiment, all of you, you're all adults here, so all of you that are here that have a mobile phone, let me just raise your hand. Okay, if, keep them up. <laughs> if you have more than one, keep your hands up. See, that's why we lead the state and the nation, actually. Californians are a lot more, more tech savvy and more mobile than, uh, than most of uh, the rest of the things, the rest of the, the, rest of the states. The other thing that that does, though, is it tells us that because we use technology so much, technology really changes the way that we have to uh, interact with our, our constituents. I, th I thought this was really funny myself. I just like putting funny stuff in my... <laughs> so let's look at the consumers that we serve as government. You know, the, the issue is that we serve consumers both from uh, the newer generations are very mobile, very tech-savvy, to ones that are maybe a little bit older and maybe not as mobile or as tech-savvy. But look at the, way, the difference in the way that these folks uh, interact just in their daily lives, the way that they get in their entertainment, the way that they do business, the way that they do computing, and, and their expectations then translate into what they expect from government. And so as government, we try to respond to the increased need, the fact that we're... we're uh, you know, stress for resources by applying technology to the services that we provide. 
So let's talk a little bit about what those services are, and let's talk a little bit about what's going on in California government. As I said, you know, the fact that we're, that we're low on, on uh, resources doesn't impact the number of folks or the, the services that folks need from us. Whether you're an aging veteran that may need services, whether you're somebody who drives on the roads that California has to maintain, or whether you're a, you know, you're a young person having to file your income taxes, there's a need for government services. Here's the thing about government, though, and I think all of you that have dealt with government know this. When you ask for government services, whether you want to or not, we make you give us a lot of information, and especially very sensitive and personal information that most of us do not want other folks to have, whether you're filing your taxes, whether you're filing for unemployment benefits, registering a vehicle, going for a professional credential, whatever it is, we make you give us a lot of information. As a result, we need to make sure that we're able to safeguard that in order to, to maintain your confidence. The, the influx of technology in government is changing the way government does things, right? The days of big giant warehouses filled with, you know, files is rapidly going away and being replaced by this. It presents some different challenges. You know, back when the days when everything was maintained in files like that in those warehouses, most of the threats were, should we say, physical. Right? You had to worry about fires, floods. You know, maybe somebody would go in and steal stuff, but you know, in a, in a place like that, it's not that easy to steal a lot of information. When we're moving to a digital space, or the challenges are different. Folks are able to access much larger uh, volumes of information, and the, you know, it puts a lot more information at risk. In addition to what we've already done, we've got some pretty big initiatives on the way. And the, I wanted to highlight these. These are only a couple of them. But I wanted to highlight these because these really represent both a unique opportunity for government to operate more efficiently, but it also puts more information uh, together and potentially more at risk. So for example, look at the, the list of projects we have here. We have the Fiscal Project, right? And what this, this project is meant to do is to consolidate and centralize the state's financial management system, which is dispersed all throughout the state. We're going to have it centralized and consolidated and virtualized or, or digitized, let's say. The next one, the Health Benefit Exchange, is a new uh, effort that's underway right now. And what this is meant to do is to provide an online eligibility self-service system for folks applying for health care benefits or health insurance benefits. Again, very critical, very sensitive information that we're going to be gathering that uh, is going to be put together in a virtualized and uh, digitized environment. The other project over there, the Centralized Revenue Opportunity System, is a new project being taken on by the Board of Equalization. So the BOE is trying to consolidate and uh, access taxpayer information, tax information, and put it together in a centralized repository. And as you can see, we have other ones there having to do with electronic medical records that are already in place. The point of this is that all these projects, all this movement towards, uh, towards a digital way of doing government really is going to have an impact on the amount of data that's available, the amount of data that we're responsible for securing and safeguarding. Other areas are also going to impact the way that, that you all that work in the security space are going to have to interact with government consumers. You know, we're, moving, we're making a big push towards social media for government to connect to consumers through social media. It, it places new responsibilities on us. One, uh, folks that do work with government and interact with us are going to want to know that they're getting information from trusted sources. So again, another big challenge for you in the IT space. Here's another one. Those of you that uh, have heard me speak before or looked at our, uh, or have heard our director of, of OTEC speak, know that government is interested in moving into the cloud. State government is particularly. We're interested in putting our infrastructure, we're interested in putting our apps into the cloud because it provides some unique opportunities for government. It also provides some unique challenges. So I have a little bit of a pop quiz for you here. You know, I talked about the difference between the 21st century and 20th century consumers. How many of you recognize this as the first example of government in the cloud? Anybody know what this comes from? I thought for sure. Okay, how about now? 
You guys remember that episode of Star Trek where there was this, you know, two societies, the ruling society was up in the clouds? Okay, so I thought I saw a couple of old, old timers here, but maybe not. All right, let's move it into the 80s. How many of you recognize that government in the cloud, the 80s version? Couple? How about a little more current? How about that? Who knows what that's from? The Avengers, that's right. <laughs> couple of generation Y over here. <laughs> but it's true. We're, we're interested in moving into the cloud. And again, the cloud presents some unique uh, challenges for government, especially in the security space. You know, whether it's a private cloud that we run and manage ourselves, we're basically allowing folks to consolidate infrastructure, consolidate applications, or especially if we move into the public cloud. The main point of my presentation is that we, IT security is a big challenge for government. So that's why it's good that you're all here. You know, there's a, there's a, lot, of, uh, a lot of things that we need to do in government. The most basic one of, of them is to be able to connect with and serve our consumers. In order to do that, we have to be able to really maintain their confidence. And we do that by maintaining the, sec the security and by safeguarding the data that we collect from them. As we move more and more into a digital space, the challenges are going to change. One of the things that I think we're going to have to do is change the perceptions of the folks that are out there using technology. You know, I think for the most part, folks expect that uh, you know, the sorts of, of issues and threats that are out there are what you see there on the right, you know, the organized, you know, very sophisticated uh, individual that comes in. But it's not the case. Nowadays, because we do so much through technology and we interact so much with, with our consumers, we have to protect against all threats, including, you know, the, the hacker who's, you know, the lone individual working out of their parents' basement. So we have a lot of, uh, we have a big challenge for us here. It's important that you're here, and it's important that you're here because of the program we put together for you is really meant to provide you and equip you with the information to help you meet that challenge. You know, I was looking through the program. We have some very good speakers that are here. We have experts from the private sector. We have our vendors that are here that have not only partnered up, you know, to help put this event on, but to bring some very critical information for you. So here's your challenge, playing on the Mission Impossible theme. Your mission today is to get the most you can out of this forum. Secondly, I want you to ask a lot of questions of the presenters. You know, whether it's a speaker coming in, you know, from the Department of Homeland Security or any of the experts that are going to be on the panels. Thirdly, learn what you can. Learn as much as you can from the gathered experts that we have here. And then go back home, back to your departments, back to your agencies, and apply what you learn. And most importantly of all, take the lessons that we learned today and really make sure that you safeguard the public trust. You know, they depend on us for a lot. As I mentioned earlier, you know, government is big for a reason. Folks need the services that we provide. We can only provide them effectively if they're able to trust us with the information that they entrust with us. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference.